All right, so uh, let's, let's get into the scripture this morning. We at, here at Hewitt Community Church, we are in a series entitled Jesus the Messiah. It is through this series that we are very slowly, very methodically uh, studying the gospel of Matthew. Uh, today we are continuing in Matthew chapter 5. However, uh, we are going to be finishing up the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, you remember they started in Matthew 5, 3. We're going to be finishing it up uh, the Beatitudes this morning, begin with, beginning with Matthew 5.10. Uh, let's start right there, Matthew 5.10. Let's look at this together. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me, let me, let's don't overlook that too quickly. Let's look at this again. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, so in breaking this beatitude down, I think the place to start is with that word persecuted. Uh, I think it may be safe to say that when we think of persecution, the first place that we would go to in our minds is to think of violence, uh, perhaps bodily harm. I think it might be uh, logical to say that we maybe think of the stoning of Stephen. Maybe we think of that when we think of persecution. Uh, perhaps we think of how that the early Christians were thrown to the lions and persecuted in that respect. And that is persecution. I, I don't want to give anyone the impression that that is not persecution. However, that is not the kind of persecution that's being communicated here in Matthew 5.10. Uh, the kind of persecution that is being communicated here uh, is more along the lines of harassment or, or manipulation. Uh, the objective is not so much to do harm to you as much as it is about controlling you. That, that's the objective behind this kind of harassment. But what's really interesting here is the reason behind the harassment. It's not because of anything that you've necessarily done or not done. It's not because of your political affiliation. It's not because of your political views. It's not because of the football team that you support. It's not even really because of the church you attend. It is because of righteousness. It is because that you currently have a right relationship with God. That is the overall reason for the harassment or for the persecution. Now, a logical follow-up question would be to ask this. How in the world could my righteousness... How in the world could my personal relationship with God agitate somebody else to the extent that he or she would want to harass me, to make trouble for me, or would want to persecute me? How in the world does that even compute? Well, Jesus answers the question in the very next verse, Matthew 5.11. However, I want you to look at this with me, Matthew 5.11, in the Message Bible. I think the Message Bible in this context does a very good job in giving us an explanation. Look at this with me. Hey, he says, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down, throw you out, or speak lies to you to discredit me. There it is. There's the reason. There are those who want to discredit God. Why do they want to discredit God? Continue reading. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort. In other words, there are those who do not like the truth of the gospel... They do not like the truth of who God is. They have decided for themselves to reject the character of God. They have decided for themselves to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, which I might add is within their rights to do so. It is your prerogative if you personally want to reject the God of the Bible 
or you want to reject the gospel. I can't deny that that is a personal right that you, you can exercise. However, where the trouble comes in is the self-same people then insist that everyone else reject the God of the Bible and reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might say it like this. They've exercised their right to choose, but they don't want you to exercise your right to choose. And so that's where the harassment comes from. And then look what Jesus continues to say in Matthew 5, 12, still reading out of the Message Bible. Look at this. He says, And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. In other words, the rejection of the God of the Bible, uh, the rejection of the gospel is nothing new. It's always been around. Therefore, this kind of manipulation, this kind of harassment is nothing new. There always has been and there always will be those who are opposed to the gospel. Therefore, there always has been and there always will be those who are dead set on persecuting the righteous that are dedicated to harassing those of us who do believe in the God of the Bible and who do believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that said, I, I think we can agree that we Americans, we, we, we've been pretty lucky on that score. I, I think it's fair to say that while one might argue that there is a growing sentiment against Christianity in our nation. Nevertheless, by and large, we're still free to worship the God of the Bible. We're still free to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ without any outside ramifications. I think we can all agree that uh, compared to a lot of other countries and the Christians on the other side of the world, we've dodged a bullet, right? We, we have nothing to complain about. But that said, I, I want you to look at something that Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.12. This is fascinating. He says this, In fact, everyone who wants to live, to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Look at that. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be be persecuted. In other words, harassment or persecution for righteousness, that is for faith in God, for faith in uh, the work of Christ, that is standard operating procedure for all Christians. If you are a Christian, if you identify as a Christian, then you can and you should expect at some point to suffer harassment or persecution for your faith. Now, isn't that some great news? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Now, okay, now, now let's look at this realistically. Again, we're American Christians. And so I think Paul's statement here causes at least me to come back in, to full circle and ask questions. Well, how does this apply to Christians? Well, look at 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 with me. I think we find the answer right here. Uh, he says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Now, let me stop right there. That expression, prowl around, if you look at that and study that loosely translated, it means harass. Very self-same thing that we're talking about this morning. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, harasses like a roaring lion looking for someone to, vet, to devour. And look at what he says in the next verse, verse 9. He says, know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And so what Peter is saying this is, is this. He's saying, 
even if over the course of your entire life, if it is possible, even over the course of your entire life, you never suffer persecution or harassment once in the physical realm for your faith, you can be absolutely sure that you will be suffering harassment and persecution in the spiritual realm for your faith. As a matter of fact, Peter goes on to say, every believer in the known world can expect at the very minimum to be harassed by Satan or by one of his henchmen over the course of their faith. That is a promise, if you will, that the Scripture is essentially making. Now, suffice it to say that to preach on persecution in the church today is not a very popular subject. Also suffice it to say that to preach on the devil is not a popular subject. And then when you preach on both of them at the same time, I am really putting myself out on a limb. But I want you to hear me this morning. I have an obligation to preach the hard stuff right along with easy stuff. And whether you like to hear it or not, the Bible tells us that Satan is real. Moreover, as we've read today, the Bible tells us that persecution is absolutely certain. Now, why does it tell us those things? Well, believe it or not, it doesn't tell you those things to scare you or to make you uncomfortable. But it does tell you those things to educate you, to make you aware, and also to prepare you for those spiritual attacks. So let's look at Satan's harassment this morning through the lens of Scripture. By first of all, looking at this, 1 John 4.4. 4. Let's, let's get a, a realistic picture of this. Look at this. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I think that's a great place to start, don't you? When we're talking about the harassment of Satan, that's a great place to start. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Satan is a defeated foe. He knows it, and now you need to know it. However, you also need to know that just because he is defeated, a defeated foe, that is not going to deter him from trying to deter you from, point, from going in the direction of blessedness. I mean, keep in mind, we've been studying the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are about blessedness, about going in the direction of blessedness. Blessedness when you do things God's way as opposed to your way. The devil knows that he cannot necessarily keep you from the blessedness of eternity. But if he can, he's going to do everything he can to keep you from the blessedness that God wants for you today. That's his ultimate goal, is to keep you from the blessedness of today. I mean, you remember the story uh, in, in the book of John of Lazarus? And, and you remember when Jesus encountered Martha? And he said, Lazarus is going to rise again. And she said, oh, I know. I know he's going to rise again someday in the resurrection. And, and, and I'm paraphrasing here. He said, no, 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 no. You don't get it. I am the resurrection of life. I am the resurrection of life, not just for someday. I'm the resurrection and the life for today. For today. And I think that that's what today's Christians need to hear. He is the resurrection and the life for today. In the midst of your spiritual harassment, he is the resurrection and the life for today. In, in the midst of the Satan's attempts to divert you away from the blessings of God, he is your answer for today. Can you say amen to that? All right. So having said that, uh, let's look at Satan's primary weapon of choice to divert us away from the blessings of today. It's deception. That, that's his primary weapon of choice. Look with me, John 8, 44. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. 
When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and, and the father of lies. Okay, what part of this do you not understand? Satan never tells the truth. Satan never tells the truth. Satan hates the truth. Satan can't stand to be in the same room with the truth. But he does have this peculiar ability to make lies sound like truth. And so the question that's first of all facing us this morning, okay, well, how do we fight that warfare tactic? Well, let me, let me tell you two things you need to know. Number one, you need to remember that Satan is always under God's authority. Satan is always under God's authority. Uh, Daniel 4, uh, verse 34 says this, God's dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And look at this next part in verse 35. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven... And the peoples of the earth. In other words, you could say it like this. Satan, just like everything else, and just like everybody else, is under the authority of a sovereign God. He always has been, and he, and he always will be. Therefore, any harassment that he should bring into your life is only limited to what God allows. Are we on the same page? Okay, well, a logical question is, well, why would God allow Satan to harass me in the first place? Okay, stay with me here. Believe it or not, it is for your good. It is for your good that God allows Satan in limited doses to harass you. Okay, now you might say, well, how, how, does, the, how does the world did that work out? Well, look with me at, at Romans 5, 3, and 4. Look at this. Paul writes this. He said, we celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, perseverance, proven character. Uh, this passage, it, it falls directly in line with the Beatitudes. Paul is talking about blessing. And in this context, he is talking about the fact that God wants to bless you with proven character. Are you, are you following me? We're all on the same page. Well, what does that mean exactly? God wants to prove himself. God wants to prove himself to you. God wants to prove his faithfulness to you today. That would have really been a good place to say amen. God wants to prove his provision to you today. God wants to prove His healing to you today. God wants to prove His mercy to you today. God wants to prove His accessibility to you today. How else can He prove Himself in these areas outside of allowing you to experience some trouble and some tribulation and some harassment? He can't. There's no way that he can prove these. Listen, if life were perfect and everything was going wonderful, why would you need God? And so he allows Satan to harass you, to make trouble for you, so that he can turn around and prove himself to you. And listen, there is nobody better in the business of creating trouble than Satan. He wants the best for you all the time. That brings me to the second thing you need to know, and that is this. Whatever means God uses to advance the kingdom of heaven in you, um, those can be the self-same means that God uses to steal the kingdom of heaven, that Satan uses uh, to steal the kingdom of heaven from you. Well, stay with me on this. Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Um, the way that Satan works 
is, is he looks for the weak areas in your life, right? He looks for those vulnerable areas in, in, in your life. And, and, and just an FYI, I think it may be safe to say that the weak areas, the vulnerable areas in your life are those areas of your life where you're still trying to do things your way instead of God's way. That would be the first place I would look if I were looking for weak areas in my life. Um, and, and Satan, once he's identified the, these weak and, and vulnerable areas, you can be sure that he's going to use whatever means he can to get a foothold there. Uh, for example, let's take relationships. You know, the Bible says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Uh, the Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. Blessed are those whose quiver is full of them, right? But can I tell you, those can also be the self-same sources that Satan can get under your skin. I mean, let's be honest. Even in our loving and our closest relationships, Satan knows how to use those things. He knows how to use the blessings of God to, if he can, divert us away from the blessings that God has for us today. That's, that's the way that he works. Um, how about just other people in general? You know, I mean, I am grateful that I have a nice truck to drive. I am grateful that I live in a town that has nice paved streets. But can I tell you that there are some days when it is all I can do not to lose it on Hewitt Drive? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Uh, how about this? Um, how about finances or our health crisis? Those things can be very effective at distracting us and diverting our attention from our faith. Even the church. I mean, have you been reading about some of the stuff that is going on in some of our churches today? Have you been reading about some of the division and just, just the despicable behavior that is going on in bodies that are supposed to represent the body of Christ? It is enough to divert your attention away from your faith. It is enough to deceive you into thinking that maybe God isn't who He says He is. And maybe the gospel isn't what it says that it is. It's those inroads where Satan then says, you know, if God were God, if He were really who He, who he says He is, He wouldn't be letting this happen right now. If God were who He was, you'd be healthy right now. You'd be successful right now. You'd be rich right now. If God were who he says he is, he, he wouldn't put up with the way you're being treated right now. Well, Ephesians 6.12 is essentially saying pay attention. He's saying see those things for how they really are. It's not people that's harassing you. It's not your spouse that's harassing you. It's not your kids that are harassing you. It's not the 90-year-old person going down Hewitt Drive that's harassing you. It's not the circumstances which are harassing you. It's not your limitations which are harassing you. It's not your failures which are harassing you. And it's not the church who's harassing you. It is Satan who's harassing you. And he is harassing you in the exact same manner that a lion harasses his prey. It wants to divert you, and it wants to isolate you. If he can divert you, and he can isolate you from the truth of the gospel, if he can uh, divert you and isolate you from the encouragement of being with other believers, if he can divert you and isolate you from the power of prayer, then he is ultimately going to be able to manipulate you away from blessedness. That's the way that Satan works. Okay, so that's fundamentally his battle plan. Now let's look at God's battle plan. Can we do that? Uh, let me take you to Matthew 5.10. Let me, let me back to that. Christ, he says something here that's very, very peculiar. He says, blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted. In other words, this is what he's saying. He said, when you find yourself being harassed by Satan, you are in a very good place. That does not make sense to me. How is it that if I'm being harassed by Satan, that that's a good place for me? 
Well, remember what we said? Satan hates the truth. Hayden, Satan can't stand being close to the truth. He can't stand being in the same room with the truth. And so the reality and the blessing is, if Satan is harassing you, it is because you are very, very close to the truth. It is because you are living in the truth. It is because you are embracing the truth. You are going in the direction of blessedness, and that is too much for Satan's comfort. That's where the blessedness comes in. Uh, that's the reason James writes in James 1, verse 2 and 4. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The reality is, whenever you're far away from the truth, whenever you're diverted away from the truth, Satan's not going to bother you because you're already doing his job for him. You're making it easy. But when the truth is in you, oh, when, when the truth is close to you, when you are connected to the truth, and when you're acting on the truth, that's when you get his attention, and that's when you get his harassment. And the irony is, James says that the enemy's manipulations only serve to identify and to clarify those areas where you're the most vulnerable. They, they serve to identify and to clarify those areas where you are far from the truth. And you know how you fix that? You just bring it under the blood of Jesus Christ. What did we sing just a little bit ago? Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for that redeeming blood, for that covering. First John 1, 9, just confess your sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. You can fix that vulnerable area. You can fix that weak area. You can get back close to the truth, and you have Satan to thank for it. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? How God can use him to help you identify those weak areas. So you might say, well, Pastor, I, I like what you're saying so far, but how do I get started? Well, I think you get started by going back to the beginning. Let me take you back to the beginning, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. D did you notice that the beatitude started with the promise of the kingdom of heaven and they end? with the promise of the kingdom of heaven. And so what that implies is, is sort of a reciprocal action. You fight off the attacks of Satan the same way that you do everything else. By admitting your spiritual vulnerability and by your continual dependence upon the provision and the protection of God. And you might say, well, why should I do that? Well, it's because it is no more and it is no less than what Jesus Christ had to do to secure the blessings of the kingdom of heaven for you. Look with me at Philippians 2, 5 and 8. This is a familiar passage to believers today, but it is so powerful. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Look at that again. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2 is telling us that when Christ came to earth, he came as a beggar. That is, he came as a mind with the mindset of total dependence upon the provision and upon the direction of his benefactor, Father God. And you know the story in the gospel. Following God's plan, being obedient to the direction that God led him, it, it led to some, well, it led to some logical places. It also led some illogical places. It, it led towards some things which made perfect sense, 
but it also led towards some things which made no sense whatsoever, including being harassed and persecuted by Satan. We have the Gospels that confirm this. And you might say, well, what was the outcome? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. The outcome was blessedness. Look with me at Revelation eleven fifteen. 15. It says this, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Messiah, and He will reign forever and ever. You know what this means? It means that through His poverty, Jesus Christ secured forever the kingdom of heaven. He secured forever the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. Not just for someday, but for today. Oh, but notice what he does with the blessing to the kingdom of heaven. He did, he did not secure those things so he could hoard them upon himself. He has secured those things for you and for me. That is the truth. And that is the truth that Satan wants to keep you from. Let me close with this. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. In verse 33, it says this, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. How do we seek the kingdom and the righteousness of God? I think it begins by declaring our poverty. We, we just simply declare that in of ourselves, we, we just can't do this thing called life. In of ourselves, as hard as me, we might work to point ourselves in the direction of blessedness, it just can't be done. It can only be done when we open ourselves up to the fullness and the blessedness that is characterized by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if you should find yourself being persecuted, harassed by Satan in the process, don't worry over it. Rejoice over it. Because it means that you're going in the right direction. Because it means that you're in close proximity to the truth. Because it means that the kingdom of heaven is on the horizon. Can I, I just tell you, uh, I, I don't want to get into too many details, but, but this week I got a phone call. Uh, I, I actually, I got it prefaced with a, with a, a text message. And, and the text message said this, I need to talk to you. I, I know what that means. When somebody says, I need to talk to you, then it's, it's very rarely good. And so I make the phone call and... Sure enough, it's, it's not great news. It is, it is diverting news. It is news that deflates. It is news that discourages. And, and the most frustrating part of it for me was there was absolutely nothing I could do. Nothing I could do. And I thought of this message. And in that moment, I said, Lord... I am a spiritual beggar. I'm a spiritual beggar. I am completely destitute. I have absolutely no power whatsoever. And so I give this to you. Did you know that this morning, about 1.45, somewhere in that ballpark, I woke up and I started praying over some things. And this is one of the, the things, this phone call that I'm referring to. I, I, I prayed about that. And a lot of times when I wake up like that, I have a really hard time falling back to sleep because my mind is just going everywhere. I think that's what comes with old age. Anyway, can I just tell you, it does. It just, you know, it just, my mind just is everywhere. And uh, can I tell you, once again, I prayed the same prayer that I prayed on Friday. I said, Lord, nothing has changed here. I am still completely dependent upon you and your, your provision. I trust you for that. Can I tell you, I fell back into the deepest sleep and did not wake up until the alarm went off. And that, listen, that is a blessing for me because that n does not normally happen to me. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, as a pastor, forget the pastor part. 
I'm telling you as your friend, as your friend who loves you and wants the best for you, listen to God. Don't listen to Satan. He's trying to tell you stuff. He is trying to tell you a bunch of junk that is, is no more true than a man in the moon. But if you will listen to God, moreover, if you will just do things his way, and, and you know, that is hard not as easy as it sounds. But if you will do things God's way, you will be astounded at the results. And may I say this, doing things God's way begins at the foot of the cross. Let me close with this, Romans 10, 9. It says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe that today? What does that mean to be saved? Well, before we talk about what that means, let, let's talk about the stipulations here. First of all, you must declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You know what that's all about? That's about agreement. When you are declaring something, you are agreeing with it. You are openly agreeing with it. In this context... You are agreeing with what the Bible says about who God is. You are agreeing with what the Bible says about who Jesus is. Oh, but most importantly, you are agreeing with what the Bible says about who you are. Did you know the Bible says some very unpleasant things about who you are? It really does. But it doesn't say those things to frustrate you or to trouble you or to damage you. It says those things to raise your awareness of your desperate need for a Savior. And the good news of the gospel is the Savior is available in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why we must declare with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. Now, there's a second stipulation. You must believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead. What is that all about? Well, basically, it means that from that day forward, from this day forward, you're not going to do things your way. You're going to do things God's way. And to do things God's way, of course, you've got to be a student of the Scriptures. You need, to, you need to read up on that. You need to have the encouragement of other believers, that sort of thing. But you also need to know that this is not about willpower. You really don't have it within you. I'm, I'm sorry, this is another truth of the Scripture. I'm, I'm just telling you what the, the Bible says. There, there is nothing really in you, yourself, that can cause you to do things God's way. You've got to have some supernatural help. And the Bible says that at the point where you confess or you agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, there is a spiritual transaction that takes place, namely the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, comes to live inside of you. The Bible says it is exactly the same Spirit that raised Christ, a dead body, back to life after three days in the grave. If it can raise a dead body back to life after three days, then it can point you in the direction of blessedness, piece of cake. But you've got to cooperate. And you've got to decide, Lord, I want to do things your way. I want to go in the direction of blessedness, but you're going to have to help me. That's what being saved is. Being saved is admitting your need for a Savior and acknowledging that that Savior is found in none other than Jesus Christ, and also acknowledging that when you follow that Savior, when you submit to that Savior, He will point you in the direction of blessedness, not just for this life, but for the life to come. And I do not feel that I would be doing my job as a minister of the gospel if I did not give everyone within the sound of my voice an opportunity to act upon Romans 10.9. And so I would like to ask as we bring this uh, service to a close that you would pray this prayer with me. Let me warn you, there's nothing magical in the words, but I do believe there is something very powerful and very transformative in the spirit behind it. And so as you pray this prayer, as you repeat this prayer after me, I would ask that you would concentrate about what is taking place in the spiritual realm, even as you pray this prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I believe that your word is true. Yes, I do. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. 
I believe he was born of a virgin. I believe he lived a perfect life. I believe he died on the cross. And I believe he rose again. Also that I may have forgiveness for my past. Abundant life for my today. And eternal life for my tomorrow. Therefore, I declare with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to give me a new heart. I ask you to take control of my life. And I ask you to point me in the direction that you'd have me go. Thank you for doing this. In Jesus' name, amen.